Imagine for a moment a world without art, without dance, opera, literature, poetry. That world would be a very, very dull place. Today on the show, we have Greg Kaminsky. He received his master's in medieval studies from a Harvard affiliate and has spent decades as a practitioner and scholar of various esoteric and spiritual traditions, as well as an avid student of Vajraja Buddhism. Now, Greg is also the creator, producer, and co-host of the long-running podcast, A Cult of Personality, which explores esoteric topics with authors and experts in the field. Um, it's been taking a while to get you on this show, Greg, due to a lot of personal issues. I'm so glad you're willing to take the time to talk with us, especially in light of everything that's going on. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to speak with you again, Jimmy, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, I don't know, we were kind of talking before, um, we had both uh, discussed, uh, well, I should backtrack. Originally, why I wanted to have you on the program was to talk about um, the New Age movement, um, talk about, uh, you know, uh, primarily, um, there's a lot of folks, you know, particularly in the music and art scene, which I am a uh, participant of, uh, I always run into these guys who, you know, they just kind of uh, have a bunch of half-truths, half-facts, and really don't know what they're talking about. But they all just, like, string it together, and uh, they just kind of put it underneath this, like, new age or quote-unquote spiritually woke uh, ideology mm. or spiritual practice. And, uh, you know, they just kind of pick and choose whatever they want and throw it together without really having any background. Now, originally I wanted to kind of talk with you so we can go over both the Western and... Uh, Eastern influences of the New Age movement and kind of, you know, get some clarity. But, you know, I think that there is more pressing matters to discuss um, with everything going on with the virus, with uh, what now I think we have uh, the most cases going forward in the world. Um a lot of millions upon millions of people in uh, social isolation. We have, uh, what, about 3 million unemployment claims uh, soaring in. So people are in a state of anxiousness. They're in a state of dread. Um, I mean, people that I've talked to and, um, you know, view uh, viewing on social media, um, they just think the sky is falling in on them. And, um, you know... I think you can offer such a great perspective on everything that's going on and kind of um, offer the wisdom of the ages in how that how we should be focusing on this, but also how we can use this as an opportunity both for spiritual growth as well as, um, I don't know, kind of uh, using that isolation as a way to recenter ourselves with uh, more distinct purpose. Well, certainly give it my best shot. Um, but I should preface this by saying that I personally don't really know a whole lot. Um, so anything that I'm going to tell you that sounds, uh, like it's been tried and tested, uh, or like some sort of uh, wise words is most likely the result of, uh, things I've been taught or, uh, the result of doing, uh, at least for me, fairly intense spiritual practice, um, for an extended amount of time again for me. So I guess the first thing I would like to say is that I think your original idea for a topic and the new topic that we're going to discuss do have an interface, which is that for those who don't have a strong foundation 
in an actual, authentic tradition that includes some aspects of faith. And I know a lot of people don't like that word, but it's a good word. So I'm going to use it. And you're going to hear me use it again tonight. Um, I think that is would serve people better in times like these than the sort of uh, supermarket smorgasbord type situation that you described where people kind of pick and choose things they believe in or some practices they might do for a while or some weekend workshops that they might go to or some books they read or what have you. I mean, I, none of those things are in and of themselves bad. They're not. They're actually good because they show some authentic longing towards like a more a, a desire to grow as a person. But uh, they do those sort of things do not provide one any real comfort or solace in times when people are dying, uh, when people are sick, when people are hungry, when there's war, you know, all of those when, because ultimately we all come to a time, you know, whether it's this situation or another, but old age, sickness, and death, they're coming for all of us because we're human and we're all going to die. And the real question is, when that time comes, what are you going to rely on to face that head on? Because I'm telling you, if you don't have some kind of wisdom backing you up at that point, you're you're going to end up like most people, like terrified, um, desperate. Um, that's no way to leave this realm. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, that's no way anybody wants to leave this world. Kind of um, clenching for a sense of hope that you just can't really have any experience of. But uh, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, I feel like a lot of that dread that we uh, – that we that we feel at least you know in this modern society going back to that word faith is that people associate that word faith with um, a literal interpretation of you know a, a biblical or religious uh, text and or tradition right you have to have faith you have to uh, completely allow your subjective experience to subvert the objective right i mean the whole idea of uh, the modern interpretation of faith is that uh, you know you're believing something with an absence of fact right and, yeah that's not the type of faith i'm talking about right right and i think that's where the biggest uh, misinterpretation comes for a lot of folks you know is that the type of faith at least when I think of the type of faith is um, the type of um, ex the type of subjective experience one one has with knowing their sense of divine within them, right? You have to go, take that journey within yourself to the point that you discover this divine essence and that is this um, sort of sense of faith or proof that you have of the divine, right? You have to find that within it. You can't. Ju you have to find that within yourself. You can't just look for it blindly. You know, relying on the spiritual experiences of others. Yeah, I mean, I think there's many dimensions to this. Um, on a superficial level, it means that. A religious tradition has some belief, you could call faith, that there is a divine whatever you want to call it, okay? So that's it at like the most basic level. And so that, when I say, when I say talk about faith, I mean that. 
there's also what you describe this sort of uh, recognition that within ourselves there is some connection to this great mystery of whatever it may be. So there's, and I mean that. And there's also the faith and that is developed by exercising skepticism in applying uh, the lessons of teachings and a teacher in spiritual practice over years and over many deeds. And I mean that type of faith as well. And there are others. So I think, and these are all related to one another as well. I don't think these are necessarily like completely distinct types of faith. They all are, it's all connected. Um, but it is ultimately a, um, a willingness at some point to, um, trust that I think, at least for me at this point, that I just don't know it all myself, that, that I can't control it. And that, on some level, there is ultimate meaning. And you're right, it does involve a reframing as well, because I think you have to have a different sort of a view of reality. Because um, if you say, you know, this, there's just a physical substance, material reality, and I'm a distinct human being it's a subject in a world of ob separate objects. And when death comes, that's it. There's nothing more. Well, that's entirely nihilistic. And um, if that's your view, you should definitely fear death. But um, for someone who has a view that all is the divine and that this um, feeling that I exist as a self while certainly palpable is uh, really just a, a misconstruing of reality and that um, there is something greater going on or not going on as the case may be. And that is sort of like the way I interpret that sort of faith in the divine. Um, I don't know. And it takes many forms and people grapple with it. And it, I don't think it's like a static state where either you have faith or you don't. I think that's super simplistic, almost yeah. as simplistic as the way people think of the divine as some old man in the sky or that the Bible is some kind of literal history. You know, and I, I think it would behoove us to stay away from those simplistic sort of interpretations, especially, you know, considering what's going on now. I mean, I don't know when I think about, you know, taking into account, you know, your kind of perception of faith, I kind of see it as almost um, almost a type of growth. Right. Um for you to, you know, achieve this, you know, uh, level of faith, one, you have to reject your ego, right? You have to, you have to reject the ego's perception of what is occurring around it, which is limited to sensational perception, right? As well as, you know, whatever might be uh, going on in your personal subconscious at that time in your life and, you know, the situations that have shaped that, which are, you know, also limited by your senses. Um, so when you're limited in that perception, um, I don't know, the ego just makes you want to deny that inner uh, that inner divine essence that you have because it makes you more dependent on it. It makes it seem like it is the end all. And, uh, you know, with, I mean, particularly in the uh, spiritual state of the modern world, um, I feel like a lot of people's egos are winning that battle because over, well, 
over time, you know, at least the way I view uh, society, we have become more individualistic. We have become more egocentric. Um, everything is commodified to the point that, you know, people on whether it's either social media or, you know, through their own uh you know, business, they try and brand themselves mm. as a commodity as opposed to an individual and an, and a uh, asset with their own essence of the divine. Um, so I feel like, I feel like, you know, this path of faith, you know, even though it's not like a simplistic, literal interpretation of faith, it is um, a rejection of that notion of the self and to reject the ego and to reject that limitation on perception and to open your mind to what could be, whether that is, uh, you know, found in your imagination or expression, you know, doing art, whether that's through spiritual practices. I mean, it's all about that inward journey. And um, I don't know, like with everything that's going on, I feel like there is an opportunity for people to kind of use this as a way to reject those labels that have that people use to define them right so right now you know if you have lost your job um if you're you know socially isolated by yourself um it really gives you a chance to reestablish who you are by looking at those labels and how we have chosen to define ourselves and with those things stripped away you know what do you have in your sense of self what do you have when you can't define yourself by your job or by your friends or by your family or even, you know, with a lot of churches being shut down by your, um, you know, religious um, uh, religious identification. You know, when you don't have those um, self-ejectified things that you want to label yourself as, it really strips away those kind of um, labels that support the ego and how you want to define yourself. And it really brings you to a more um, centered base um, of self, if that makes sense. I think so. Um, I think it does make sense. Um, I, I mean, I've think it would be a good idea for people to reject those sorts of, um, identities that they take on the career, you know, that's the big one. Um, and I think there's others as well, like, you know, anybody like who's got like a serious hobby is that's another one people put on, um, appearance and fashion, like just general appearance is another one. Um, you're right. Friends, family, um, sort of like your socioeconomic status. That's like your, the cultural background that you have like that's another one and all of these are not uh, they're they're so temporary and shift so easily like you say like you like you don't go out of the house for two weeks and all of a sudden like who am i like that's unstable right so knowing at least and seeing the instability in that i don't know how one can base their identity in appearance in that way right i mean i feel culturally that's what we're conditioned to do of course that not not even just this culture it's just it's just a human tendency and i mean what i've been taught is really the first mistake is really when and and i think this happens sort of pre-consciousness even is when the luminosity sort of arises from the emptiness and there's a perception of like itself and uh, what it's being perceived as different. And that leads into all of this. So the perception itself, I don't think is actually the problem. And appearance, this realm itself, is not actually the problem. The problem is that our habitual tendency to misconstrue the perception for something that it's not. 
So that at least these are this is what I've been taught and this is what I practice and I see uh, much more of a result in approaching reality from this perspective than I did from the nihilistic materialistic perspective. So um, I'm not advocating it's for everyone because I don't think that it is. But, you know, the, and I think also it's important really to think about the fact that a pandemic doesn't actually change the fundamental reality that we live in. Um, we never ever know what the next moment holds. We're all going to die at some point. We just don't know when. And, um, we all, I mean, we have to have courage in, in this sort of situation because just living in the human realm requires us to have courage. If we want to accomplish anything, if we want to have any meaning or value in our life, you know, we have to, to sort of orient ourselves in this way. So... Yeah, nothing's I mean, really fundamentally different, but yet the the superficial circumstances have com changed completely. Yeah, I mean it's um, I don't know, like when you when I would kind of go back and you know look at how I perceive meaning, right? I've always kind of categorized it in the three different things, like the way you perceive meaning. Um, at least for me, for the longest time, it was either experiencing things of great beauty, whether it's, you know, um, perceiving nature on a mountainside and just pondering, you know, the vastness and awe of every moment for, you know, billions of years that it took to get to this point. Um, experiencing like a true profound love, whether that is um, romantic, whether that's platonic or whether that's just um, a sacrificial love, you know, volunteering, um, you know, doing charity work, that sort of thing, or facing facing a disparity with courage, um, being able to face the unknown with, um, with a sense of, um, I guess, zeal for the fact that, you know, win or lose, you know, I'm successful or not, like you are going to stand your ground and you are going to give it your all. I mean, it's kind of like a sports, uh, a sports mindset you have, you know, where you want to give it your 110%. But I feel like whether it's, facing um so social isolation whether it's facing you know the the idea of death and your own mortality you have to face that with courage and you have to have um faith right in yourself to overcome that whether it is you know finding a sense of meaning whether it's um you know rising to the challenge and uh, you know facing adversity um but I don't think that, you know, that's the only way that you can kind of, you know, gain or I, I don't want to say gain that perspective, but advance one's perspective. I don't think it's the only way, but I think when you're in a situation that I, in my estimation, requires it, then if you don't do it, then I think you end up suffering the the doubts and the second thoughts and the, you know, constant wondering like what ifs. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's that doubt that really like keeps people bogged down and sunken into their ego. Right. Um, because I mean, everybody has that, you know, those voices in their head, right? That brain noise of doubt, um, you know, feeling that you're not good enough, feeling that your voice isn't loud enough. And that kind of stuff as well, you know, makes you more dependent on the ego or those sensations of the moment, right? If you can't Okay. If you don't feel that you can find meaning, um, you know, by expressing yourself or, you know, through that inner journey, you're going to try and fill that emptiness with, uh, you know, whether it's products, a new car, um, I mean, food, alcohol, whatever the case may be, 
um, you know, people use all kinds of things to kind of fill that emptiness. Um, but where do you think, I don't know, where do you think that sense of emptiness comes from? Like, do you think it's something that people, um, you know, can overcome in any sense, or is it just something we have to cope with? Well, I guess I would ask why you think the sense of emptiness is bad because that sense of emptiness is in, in essence, uh, like a, like a adumbration of reality that, you know, that in, in, in a fundamental way, everything lacks you know, as the Buddhists talk about it, lacks interdependent. It's all interdependently originating, so nothing is inherently existing on its own. So they say it's empty because it's not real in and of itself as a single thing. Nothing is. It's all. So they say it's all empty. So, and it and it's only through a realization of emptiness that one comes to actual wisdom and I don't care and I'm not just talking about in a, in a Buddhist tradition now right. I'm talking co- like in any wisdom tradition and that emptiness is exemplified through what is termed in the West uh, as like an apophatic expression and you find this in like pseudo Dionysus or anytime the uh, the divine is described as ineffable unknowable uh, you, you know, words that, that essentially describe a situation where you cannot know, perceive, even imagine the divine, right? So, and, and that is, uh, an expression of that as well. Um, so I think emptiness and, and the understanding of, on in an intellectual level because I don't think someone can realize emptiness without specific methods of practice that are designed to bring a, that about. Um, but one can intellectually understand it uh, for sure. And one has, like you say, that sort of empty feeling that nothing satisfies. So I think the emptiness is important. Uh, I also think that if we examine the way you even describe these types of situations, one, you have uh, someone acting uh, courageously, even though they may have fear, um, with care for others. And then you have, on the other hand, someone who is uh, trying to uh, fill that void in themselves, their self-concern, their, their focus is inward. It's not outward. And that, and you're right, that's like a collapsing in on itself of the ego, like a black hole that nothing can ever satisfy. No matter like all the riches of the universe will never be enough for that tyrant. Um, and that's why it's important once you If you have a view that says, you know, all is the divine, then suddenly it it negates the idea that like me as an individual self is somehow the focus of all of this, despite the fact that it is the center of my perception. So, you know, and that's something people practice it's not something you can just turn on and off like a switch um but we have time people have time to practice now for sure so uh and they have time to read and study and learn and um discover that there are other ways of being in the world that don't require you to be anxious and afraid and um so self-concerned all the time yeah, I feel that like, I mean, at least in trying to perceive emptiness as a good thing is that, you know, once we start looking at all those things that we're really lacking, it just makes us feel uncomfortable, whether it be, you know, those things that we want to have in life or whether it is um, or whether it is, you know, those things that, you know, we don't feel we have within ourselves. 
um, it just makes us feel uncomfortable. And I feel that a lot of people don't want to sit in that moment and just really, you know, ponder the idea that, you know, all happiness is just momentary, right? Everything is just momentary. It's temporary. And you're never going to have an absolute, whether it is, um, you know, whether it's happiness, whether it's love, or whether it's friendship, right? And I feel that but it's also this the self like yeah. you, you'd also like you you don't have a, a a self that's existent either so it's like a it's like there's like a deluded being thinking they're real wishing they could have things that aren't real i mean it's so ridiculous <laughs> so let me ask you i guess um, how do you shift that perception of emptiness how do you how do you it's it's hard i mean it takes practice and you have to be willing to submit yourself to the methods of an authentic spiritual path that is taught by an authentic spiritual master and it's a life's work and it might not even be accomplished at the end so I think more than anything, it just requires a complete desire to grow as a person and a acknowledgement that the typical ways of being in the world just don't ultimately work or provide a sense of meaning that, like we talked about before. And this at least provides that, at least provides a sense of ultimate meaning and um, it provides certainly more joy, but it's a lot more work. So, I mean, you certainly work for it. There's no question about that. Well, I feel like also, you know, I don't know. I feel like if, you know, the um, the root, right, of yourself is, you know, emptiness or nothingness, right? Well, it's, uh, yeah, the root of everything. Yeah. It kind of strips away, in a, in a sense, everything that you hold dear, both about the world and yourself. It strips away everything that you think could bring you meaning or should bring you meaning in life, or everything you've been conditioned to believe about life. And well, except for one. The absolute? Yeah, the divine. So I guess uh, I guess the question would be, you know, how or what is what are the first steps to try and shift that focus towards something more um, more spiritual, more absolute, um, you know, more absolute even than yourself? I mean, I think for a lot of people, the first step is to just see themselves and their own behavior, because like you don't really have to go far to engage in this work. You don't have to go anywhere. Really, all you have to do is start watching the way your own mind works, how you behave. And, um, I mean, I could recommend books or practices or things, but ultimately it really boils down to a really brutally honest examination of the way that you lie to yourself almost continuously. Well, I mean, I guess like we all lie to ourselves in such unique ways though. Like it's really hard for people to identify that, you know? Well, I'm the ways, the lies I'm talking about are, are actually lies that are common to all of us. Right. So this would be, for instance, um, we all lie to ourselves, and I'm going to choose uh, an example here that is probably more controversial than it should be. But so we all lie to ourselves in the fact that we th we believe that we know that the Earth is a sphere, right? But the fact is, we don't actually know that. We've we've been shown some photographs. And we've been uh, shown maybe some mathematical equations and some, you know, diagrams. But we don't actually know it for ourselves. 
So that's a prime example of one way that we lie to ourselves because we tell ourselves that we know things that we don't really know. Right. And right. this and if you really examine this and you break it down, you'll find there's not a whole lot that you do actually know that doesn't come from someone else, a book, a video, a teacher, some course you took in school, you know, some article you read online, you know, you know, doctor, you know, whoever. It, and so once you break it down, it's like the things that we actually know for ourselves, it's minuscule compared to what we believe it to be. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's just, it's not, uh, it's, you just haven't had that direct experience of it, right? Like, I can, uh, I mean, I can say that I kind of know the earth is uh, round because, you know, I've been up in a plane and I've seen the, you know, the, the, the curvature of the earth, right? But I've never been in space to where I have seen, you know, the glory of uh, the sphere firsthand, right? Exactly. And, um, so and this is this is an essentially trying to like redefine what knowledge is. Right. Is knowledge something that I can just sort of like collect like, you know, pieces of paper on the ground and put them in my pocket and now I know things or is really is knowledge something where I have to actually do it for myself so mm -hmm. I see it, experience it. Then I say I can know it. It's well, a totally different thing. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think it's it's uh, good to you know differentiate um, the difference between facts and knowledge because you know anybody can learn a fact, right? But I feel that knowledge is when you get a, a hands-on experience, you incorporate it into yourself more. You incorporate it into your identity. Right. Um, so when you're doing these spiritual practices and uh, you are incorporating these experiences to make that sense of self be more in tuned with the the emptiness or the nothingness or a better word, I guess, or would be stillness. reality. Yeah. Yeah. The stillness yeah. of true reality. Yeah. So basically it's like reformatting the body mind in with reality as the template instead of delusion. That would be my overall like description of spiritual practical methods. And you have to do them a lot. I mean, and I'm, I'm talking like hundreds of thousands or millions of times repeatedly in order to be able to uh, really accomplish them in the way that they're meant. Mm hmm. But it's possible to do it as well. No, I guess uh, I don't. Know, I guess just to kind of uh, keep folks uh, up to date on what we're um, talking about here, for those of you who uh, you know aren't more esoterically inclined, um, I don't. Know, just to kind of give a metaphor here and uh, a good Gnostic one at that. Uh, I think uh, a good allusion to what we're discussing is uh, the film The Matrix. Right? We live in this false reality that we that we have created for ourselves based off information that we have taken in that we just assume is reality, right? But within ourselves, if we choose to take that route, there is this truer reality that, you know, is not found in this delusional um, sense of sensation that's limited to this physical space, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Similar to, you know, once Neo's broken out of the Matrix, you know, he's like doing all these Kung Fu and like downloading these programs into himself. Um, he's downloading uh, certain practices or certain perceptions that allow him to master that delusional reality so you can like refit or reprogram that um, to where it's beneficial for your growth. Yes, exactly. That's, yeah, well put. So I guess, uh, well, I guess, I don't know if we're going to be breaking people out of the matrix, so quote unquote, um, I guess what would be that, um, what would be that, you know, red pill moment? Because, um, I don't know, from a Jungian perspective, you know, the, the first stages of that individuation process, um, is going to be identifying the shadow. Now, um, 
just to kind of, you know, give people a, uh, a uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Young himself, um, his process of individuation was finding a, a, a psycho-spiritual essence to yourself, right? And uh, one of the things he theorized is that pri- primarily when we're in, in our adolescence, um, we kind of jump from social group to social group. Uh, we are uh, experimenting with different facets of who we are, right? And as we experience these different facets of ourselves, we find, um, you know, by experiencing those different aspects of ourselves, what and what is not socially acceptable with different types of people. And we internalize that. Um, so a lot of the things that we um, have about ourselves, that we believe about ourselves, isn't necessarily true because we have been re- repressing um the darker aspects, right? That uh, sense of emptiness or dread that we can't find through these interactions, whatever the case may be. Um, so one of Young's first um, first stages in that individuation process is being able to acknowledge that there is this shadow half, this repressed half of ourselves that we, you know, have been ignoring, that we've allowed... Um, well, as as we, uh, you know, ignore it, we get this sense of delusion about who we are, right? Um, you know, whether it's an enamored self, um, you know, self-importance, that sort of a thing. Um, and I feel like when we ignore that shadow, that's where that I am the center of this reality and all of this is for me comes in. And when... We, and I just facing that shadow and just facing all these things we don't want to accept about ourselves, I mean, that's a painful process. That's a very painful process, and I just don't think that many people are really willing to engage in that kind of dark night of the soul. Yeah, I probably agree with you. Um, So, yeah, and I mean, I think the Jungian path is only one example of a path, so... Uh, you know, there are other paths that, uh, don't involve like such, you know, uh, wrestling with the shadow in that way. Um, the, the, I think the crux of it though, is it doesn't really matter what path you take. If you want to change and grow as a person, it requires work and that work can be you know, psychological, it can be physical, it can be, you know, meditative, it can be a combination of all of these. Uh, So it really depends on the person and the path they take. But they're going to work. Anyone who's really changed in an authentic way has earned it. And none of us are any different. Yeah, I mean, I I guess, uh, you know, when it comes to, like, that work aspect of it, then, I mean, how do you, I don't want to say train yourself, because that's not, um, it's not the right word. How do you prepare yourself um, for that kind of hard spiritual path? How do you prepare yourself to, you know, kind of delve into those psychological issues that you don't necessarily... um, feel that you may be ready to face because, I mean, I don't think, well, I mean, I don't think anybody is truly ever ready to embark on that path, but it is, um, I mean, there's got to be ways that you can kind of condition yourself to be more acceptable to, you know, uh, kind of questioning your own reality, questioning your own perceptions, and ultimately admitting that you're, you know, maybe wrong. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, I think the Buddhist path in general does a good job of this in terms of presenting the tools for this sort of thing. Like they have this idea of the four thoughts that turn the mind to Dharma. You know, the first one is a precious human birth. So you contemplate how rare and fortunate you are to be born as a human being in a world where there's lots of humans, but we're not even the, you know, most numerous of species on the planet. Like there's insects and all kinds of things. Like there's many types of life, plant life, uh, fungus, like, you know, but being born a human 
you know, we can walk upright, we can think, we have a brain, we can communicate with each other, uh, we have the ability to create and build things. So uh, it's very fortunate in that respect. And that, uh, you know, if you think about all of the beings and that didn't, you know, manage to be born as human, you know, you're incredibly lucky. So I think that's, you know, the first one. And you have the others in, in terms of like the, uh, the idea of, uh, impermanence that nothing lasts forever. Nothing even lasts that long at all. Um, so there's that, uh, and so, it, it's and that goes back to the whole sort of idea that everything's empty as well because um, you you can't really find any true source of joy without the seed of falling back as they say in a situation where everything's impermanent like where where are you gonna find your joy what is it that lasts forever you know it, there's nothing so that there's something else to contemplate. Then they have this idea of karma, which, uh, you know, you could think of it simply as like the law of cause and effect. Like mm -hmm. you simply have, you know, you go through life, you do things, they have effects and then you, you know, you have to bear the consequences of your actions. And no matter who we are in this world, we all do things that cause us to suffer as consequence inevitably it's just the way it works so there's that as well um, and then finally you have this idea of like you know because of the karma everyone is suffering to some greater or lesser extent no matter who they are rich or poor healthy uh, sick wise simple it doesn't make any difference um, and that suffering won't ever stop until we consciously make an effort to end it. So thinking and considering and contemplating these thoughts should give somebody a really good foundation for then, you know, going further in, in spiritual practice in terms of being willing to do all of the hard work because when you look back and you see these four contemplations, it's like, well, I, I have no reason to rest or to procrastinate. Everyone's suffering. If I don't do something about this, it's never going to change. And, you know, like there's, there's just no reason not to do it at that point because there's only one answer. In, in this sort of uh, presentation, at least. But ultimately, there is only one answer in actuality, which is, you know, spiritual practice. Well, I think that like all those different points that you brought up, um, I think the one thing that they all have in common is that they all make one feel more gratitude in life right i mean the one thing that uh that always kind of bothers me is that people go through their day-to-day -day and they just focus on the little things that don't deserve the attention that we give them you know daily frustrations this and that um you know these temporary feelings of sadness or anger or you know not feeling appreciated right you looking to that uh, external uh validation and they don't make us feel grateful for the life that we have and the opportunities that we have. Um, you know, the, the, the first point you had about, you know, how grateful that we should be for being born in, um, you know, in a human form. Like I think about uh, uh, one of the things that I always, you know, try and remind myself is that, you know, I try, I sometimes will feel, you know, um, ungrateful for the experiences that I've been given, right? You know, I, you look at, uh, you know, a lot of Americans today, you know, are 
our future isn't, you know, necessarily as determined as it has been for previous generations, right? There's more income inequality nowadays. There is, um, I mean, the toxicity of politics is just overwhelming sometimes. And with everything going on with the virus, it's easy to lose sight that every moment is a gift and that we should be living in that moment with a sense of gratitude because we do have the ability to create. We do have the ability to um, utilize those moments and and reshape and reform and reframe those moments into being something positive. But so often we get caught in this trap where we don't want to we don't want to look at that. We don't want to perceive that. And uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know if it's like a, um, I don't know if it's um, a way that we try and cope with that sense of suffering um, or that, uh, you know, we're not really, we're not really perceiving that true sense of suffering, if that makes sense, because, uh, you know, we, we don't look at suffering as, I don't want to say an absolute. We don't look at suffering as um, as a state of reality, right? It, it's well, something I think we try people, and avoid. Yeah, I think most people, if you talk to most people, most people actually love their suffering and they would never give it up no matter what, right? It's like an alcoholic with a drink. Yeah. Like they, like... You see there's a problem, but to them, there's no problem. That's the, it's almost the exact sort of situation that exists because what cause like, well, part of what the suffering is, is like, uh, that we think we know what's going to make us happy and then we pursue it and then we end up unhappy and and then it's like a vicious circle. And it's and because what really is the true cause of joy is not like directly intuitive to almost anyone. Um, it's it's just sad. It's just a sad situation. And and it's sad whether you're seeing it from the inside or the outside. It doesn't really matter. Because we all hold the key to unlock our chains and we don't do it. So, and I'm just as guilty as this as anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, it's not like I'm pointing fingers and judging and saying, well, you guys can't, should just, do, no, I'm just, I'm saying the way we are built and wired is this is the way. And it is a ton of work to undo that. But it can be done. It can be done. It's a worthwhile to do it. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know, once people, um, you know, I don't want to say they're playing the victim role, right? But I feel like a lot of people identify with their suffering and that, mm. and they use that as a, as, you know, a crutch for their sense of self because, you know, yes. if you don't have the capability or the, you know, gumption, you know, to improve the things that, you know, make you quote unquote suffer around you, whether it's financial, whether it is, um, uh, you know, romantic, psychological, whatever the case may be. Um, if you don't feel that you have the power to improve those things within your life and within yourself, you start using that suffering as a way to define you. You start using that suffering as a way to um, um, uh, to support that delusion that it's outside of your control. Right, because our delusion is embodied. It's not just in our in our like in our head. It's it's literally embodied, and then it's enworlded. So the entirety of the, the world is is a product of our delusion and and I think you know I could be wrong but to me like seeing the whole situation with the global pandemic and society's reaction and government reaction and this the whole chaos of the of the situation really really makes me think about 
the fact that, you know, it's just, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that exactly, but, um, there's really no, no reason for us to, um, put our faith in worldly things back to the faith. Yeah. So we shouldn't, I don't, I don't think we should put our faith in government and I, and I don't think we should put our faith in political solutions and I don't think we can put our faith in, uh, science even like if you, if you're going to put your faith somewhere, it has to be in the divine because that's, like that's really the only solution that because it's outside of the whole problem situation. Right. Right. Like we're in, we're in a situation that's a, such a existential problem and trying to find a solution to it within the realm of the problem itself doesn't work. So there's no political solution that's going to solve the existential crisis. Science can't fix it. You know, the arts aren't going to do it. So what, what humanity itself, like we can't fix this like on our own. We like it really requires a, a sort of a devotion to something greater than ourselves. You know, it's just not dissimilar to like if we want to sort of uh, defeat or overcome the situation with the with the uh, pandemic that we have to devote ourselves to a cause that's greater than our own comfort and convenience it's not really different right well i mean i don't know i i feel that like I feel that the divine is found in all those things, right? It's found in art. Definitely. It's, it's found in there's science. There's nothing that's not. Yeah. yeah. It's found in, um, I mean, it, it's found in everything, right? Even uh, ugh, even in politics, um, because it's the divine that inspires all those things within us. And I feel that, you know, if you put your, your faith or your hope in just one of those, you know, you're not going to get the outcome that you're looking for. You're not going to be reassured of the situation. But if you just take little snippets of those things, right? Those little, um, those little moments that inspire you and others, um, whether it's, you know, a mural that you see on the wall, whether it is, um, you know, um, I don't know, let's take, for example, you know, the, uh, the guy who, who invented the polio vaccine, right? Um, he could have patented that. He could have made a lot of money on that, but he didn't. He gave it away, and it saved millions and millions and millions of lives. And just that act of sacrifice, right, is so inspiring. It's divinely inspired because for him, it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the external, right? It wasn't even, it probably wasn't even about the, um, you know, the, the praise and, you know, everyone telling him what a great guy he is because he did that. No, it was about doing the right thing. It was about following that voice within you. And I feel that, you know, in all those mediums, however you choose to try and find that voice within you, um, you know, spiritual practices or otherwise, you have to be sincere to what that voice wants you to be. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about those, you know, that, that inner voice of doubt that you have, right? It's not about, uh, you know, telling yourself you're a piece of shit in the morning or, you know, nobody loves you, you know, whatever, whatever depressed or kind of, uh, you know, negative thoughts that we have. I'm not talking about that voice. I'm talking about that voice that's deeper than that, that goes to your core. Um, but I don't know, I feel for a lot of people that voice gets muffled, um, whether it's, you know, the external, um, the external things muffling it, whether it's our own, you know, internal deceptions. Um, it's hard to bring that voice out when you are, you know, working two jobs, you got to get home, you got to feed the kids, you got to do all these, you have to do all these things that are expected of you, Right. A lot of people get so distracted that they don't have the time to really listen to that voice and really focus on maybe what is happiness. I mean, 
do you really know what happiness is? I mean, a lot of times, you know, uh, for example, uh, one of, uh, I went to a, a festival one time, right? And, uh, it rained the entire weekend. Like it was awful. It was just cold and it was rainy and it was nasty. And in the moment I was not having a good time, but I look back on that. Right. And I see that as a happy moment, right. Just because I kind of had that experience, you know, so happiness is both not in the moment, but in the retrospective, but also I could have been happy in that moment. Um, and then I could, you know, remember it as a negative experience later on, you know, depending on what my mood is that day. Right. So I feel like a lot of people, when they're trying to discover that inner voice, they don't want to recognize that, you know, their psychology or their, you know, mental selves are not reliable narrators on what can make us happy. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's hard really to talk about this because I don't really expect, no matter what I say, that people listening are actually going to understand it in the same way that I do. Because this is the type of thing where you actually have to do this, the practice repeatedly over years to discover and realize, you know, those truths so that you would know them for yourself about, you know, that spiritual practice is a source of joy that, um, and it's, and it's not joy in the experience of doing the practice. So it's, it's not, you're not looking for happiness in experience it's, 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 so I, it, like, there's really, this is where words and language sort of are not capable of going, but, um, essentially like looking for, you know, putting your joy, you know, in the divine where that's your source of joy. There's no seed of it ever falling back into that sense of emptiness or lack or, I thought that was going to do it, but it just didn't do it. No, there's never, ever that, ever. So that's the source of all true joy, of ultimate meaning, of real happiness, the stone of the wise, the elixir of life, the true nectar of the gods. Like it, That's what it is. And It's yeah, so it's it's really difficult to to expl- explain it to someone that all of the worldly pursuits aren't going to produce that type of joy until somebody experiences that type of joy themselves. They won't know. It's like trying to describe to you what it's like to get drunk and you've never had a drink. Mm-hmm. Like you're not going to understand me. It's a very similar type of thing. But you can't experience this joy just by doing or taking or ingesting anything in particular because it's not directly connected with any material substance phenomena. It's really about grace. And grace, in order to receive grace, you have to be devoted really and that uh, display that devotion through the practice and then the the grace happens and then there's joy and but it's not an not joy as an experience of joy it's joy that's it's 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 not like you're being joyful it's like joy is being you right that's the best way i could describe it it's like, um, I know it's like, uh, witnessing ultimate beauty, right? You, you try and hold on to it. You try and witness it. You try and experience it. But like, there's so much beauty in the world that you can't see it all at once. It's too much. It's like your heart fills up and it bursts, but mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. I feel like you just got to like sit back, relax. But that, in that bursting that is and that openness and that luminosity that is the divine that yeah. is the wisdom 
Well, I feel like you also, you know, with that, with that beauty, with that wisdom, like you just have to remember to relax and you have to hold on to it and you have to allow it to just kind of flow over you like rain, you know? And I feel like the essence of that like beautific vision that you have is just overwhelming feel of gratitude for every moment in your stupid little life. And, uh, I don't know. I feel like once you kind of have that sense of gratitude for everything good or bad, that's when you start to see the unity in it. Yeah. And I think the spiritual practice, if it's done authentically with discipline over time, the result is that the body mind can hold that grace and that joy more stably. So instead of it washing over you and being like an overwhelming feeling, it's like a constant companion that sort of informs your every, you know, I don't want to say thought necessarily, but just is it like it informs your way of being like, and literally, and I, when I use the word inform, I mean that like it, it shapes your body mind in such a way that it molds your reality into something divine, literally divine. And so that is the realization of divinity <laughs> in that way. Man, it's hard to even ponder, you know, being able to perceive such a thing. Well, we can't. We can't. Intellectually, you can't perceive it. And without doing the years of practice and the, the methods, the body-mind can't, you know, it doesn't have those. Because basically, at least what I've been taught, is these practices essentially are you're forming new organs of knowledge and learning new ways to know. So, and, and that's why there are spiritual paths so people can develop wisdom, but it, it takes practice and it takes work and it takes time and devotion. And, um, but there are people in the world who sequester themselves and really devote themselves to nothing else. And I think for someone to be successful at this, that really does require a uh, single pointedness. Like it has to be ultimately the most important thing in the person's life, I think. Well, I think that's also where, you know, the chaos of everything that's, um, that's going on right now kind of gives us an opportunity is because a lot of people now that they're going to be socially isolated, you know, if you're not allowed to really leave or go do anything or, you know, organize with friends, you know, organize, have meetings, um, go to work, like all that downtime really gives you an opportunity to try and grow. So let me ask you, what, sh what do you think people should be doing if it's their, you know, first time being isolated and they find themselves with this opportunity? Um, I think, you know, everybody's different. So I think it would be best for people to, you know, if you have a path and you have practices, you, you're all set, you can practice them. Uh, if you don't, you know, and you want to explore different methods, uh, there are many. Um, prayer is probably the least liked but the most effective, you know, and again, prayer requires faith. So not everybody, uh, is ready to just jump on that train, but, uh, meditation is always good. Um, contemplation, which by which I mean a sort of a, uh, a way of considering things, that essentially you become whatever it is you're considering. Um, and this is like sort of along the lines of the ancient idea that wherever you place your mind is not only where you are, it's what you are. Right. So if you consider something so deeply that 
you lose yourself. Like that's the sort of contemplation that I'm talking about. And, and it, obviously in this sense, we're talking about contemplating divine qualities or, uh, be divine beings or uh, saints or, you know, things of those, of that nature. Um, I think reading is also really effective in, in these types of situations. Like if you can connect with a book that really speaks to your heart, like this is a great time to really dive into that Mm -hmm. and like, and let the book inform what you do or think about or because, um, you know, I'm not locked up with these people, thank God, but um, they have books, hopefully, or and they have the internet, so they might be able to access all kinds of interesting things that are beneficial and would provide um, growth, but also, like, and I think it's important, really, to say this, uh, like, in a spiritual or sort of a metaphysical sense, the virus as an entity really desires and feeds off of our thought and worry and focus on it. So it would be better for people to focus on other things like the divine or some sort of spiritual path or growth as an individual rather than being worried and anxious about something that is more or less out of their control at the moment. Um, what is in their control is where they put their attention. So if you can put your attention on something beneficial instead of something that is panic inducing or worrisome, or it may be just concerning you're, you're still better off and because it ripples across the human mind as a single entity in a sense like the more people who are calm and composed and focused on something that is not you know concerning the better off we'll all be um so i think it's important to use this time to for benefiting ourselves if we can instead of simply a time of mass distraction Mm -hmm. or mass anxiety I think neither one of those are beneficial and um, I'll tell you the people who are going to come out of this in good shape are the people who spend this time wisely who focus on their own individual growth who are able to focus on ways of benefiting themselves, either spiritually or financially or psychologically, physically, or, or even just in their relationships with others. Mm-hmm. Um, the people who work during this time to build something, um, those are the people who are going to come out of this in good shape. And people who sit and worry or sit and watch you know, Netflix, not that there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, this is, a, this is an opportunity and we don't get opportunities like this very often where you're at home for hours, on days, weeks, possibly months on end. Like you'll never have this time again, ever, ever. It's a, crazy that we have it now, to be honest with you. So, I would implore people if they have even just the remotest little spark of a desire to grow as a person to really like let that grow and fan the flames of that into a a fire that is just all consuming. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, seizing the moment and, you know, actually trying to refocus on what you can do to make yourself happy is definitely more important than, you know, marathoning the Tiger King on Netflix. 
Uh, so just to kind of uh, step back, um, what we were um, really discussing, though, um, in a lot of ways is just how to man- master your attention and how to utilize that attention both um, from an external and an internal perspective um, to be able to um, uh, utilize that as a way not only to reframe you know the things around you, but reframe uh, reality itself and how you perceive it. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, and I don't know if this puts too fine a point on it for some people, but essentially from the perspective of wisdom or the wisdom tradition, it's, it's reorienting the practitioner towards reality, not like not altering their perspective or like overlaying some fantastical view onto reality that's not existent. It's more like they explain it as really like purifying and clarifying your perception so that you can see, so your vision is clear and you can see reality for what it is rather than through seeing it through your delusion, which is not a clear vision. So it's really more about like the practice is more about just purification of vision than it is about seeing things in a different way, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense because, well, I mean, I guess to kind of uh, look at like the Eastern perspective, there are the... um, the three traditional paths of spiritual enlightenment, uh, the way of the, I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong. The, uh, was it Fakir? There's the way of the monk and there's the way of the yogi. One involving, right. you know, mastery, like the physical body, uh, one involving, you know, that mastery or the, uh, you know, struggle with like, um, uh, factions or the way of the heart. Right. And then one being like the mastery of it, uh, through the struggle of like controlling like mental habits, uh, capabilities, but all of which are different paths to um, mastering that attention, right? Being able to clarify that vision. Um, yeah, and you also have Gurdjieff, who had the fourth way, which is a synthesis of those three paths, but it also mirrors Buddhist Tantra, which is also a, in, like an amalgamation of those three paths also. Right, right. Now, see, I'm a big fan of uh, the way of the Sly Man and uh, Gurdjieff himself. Um, the one thing I love about uh, Gurdjieff's uh, perspective on, you know, mastering attention is that, you know, um, he at least um, – Put it in, you know, well, he put it in terms that you can incorporate it into your day to day life. And the one thing I love about his um, idea of attention is that, you know, there are really three states of your being, right? There's the um, external struggle, there's the internal struggle, and you have to recognize both of those, but you don't identify with each uh, or with uh, either. So, you know, you have to be aware of the internal struggle, you have to be aware of your external struggles, but you have to kind of exist in this way of where you're witnessing both of them, not identifying with each, but, you know, taking them for what they are. But then you also have to take a step back. And the third perspective is you have to be that per, or you have to be able to witness yourself witnessing these things and kind of create those levels of separation to try and um, find your true self. Right. Um, Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, a large part of Gurdjieff's system was really concerned with self-awareness and practicing methods to become more self-aware and it really starts from the premise that we believe ourselves to be conscious but in the Gurdjieff system we're not we we're we're not even conscious we're like robots we're like mechanical beings and we have to work incorporating self-awareness which is actually quite difficult Um, Most people, without really much training, they'd be lucky, like a minute or two minutes would probably be the maximum 
someone without training could could do it. And that would be like, you know, first thing in the morning, no distractions, like really on their game. But that's not good enough. Right. So you have to you have to really develop this. And it's difficult because the way our mind works, it wants to go out. And it wants to grasp onto whatever it, you know, it, its attention is caught by. Mm-hmm. And it then identifies with those objects as separate objects that it could then grasp either intellectually or physically or both, whatever you have. Um, but this self-awareness, if one practices and develops it, you can become conscious. And then he has an entire set of teachings about the way that the body mind functions and, and different levels of understanding and levels of being that correspond to those. And, and it's basically like, you have to become more self-aware and these things all increase cone committantly like together. So if you perfect your self-awareness in essence, you're going to also be perfecting other quality, other positive qualities as like a byproduct of that. Right. Like, like as for instance, like in the spiritual path, if someone practices contemplation and develops their concentration to such an extreme level, what happens is they'll also develop extreme qualities of generosity, extreme qualities of patience, extreme qualities of joy and perseverance. And, you know, like, so by, so if you focus on developing these qualities what happens is others sort of as a, a byproduct of your work almost and the grace that's a result, uh, you become a better person in essence. You become a conscious being. You become a human being in essence and not just a mechanical robot being. Right. You become conscious of every moment you're living in almost. Well, that would be the idea Um, but I mean, truly only the master is capable of that level of awareness and being able to hold that level of awareness as their own mind Mm -hmm. because that, that requires like completely stable self-realization or gnosis. You know, um, I don't know, and this is going to be a really bad example, but, uh, you know, just to kind of get some uh, people caught up with, you know, the idea of Gertrude, um, the best example I can give of someone who is kind of like, I mean, the best example I can give that, you know, people would generally know of someone who has kind of, in my opinion, mastered the way of the sly man or the fourth way uh, would actually be Bill Murray. Um, yeah, Harold Remus actually said in an interview before he died that Bill Murray was really, really into Gurdjieff, um, studied him. And, uh, you know, if you look at what Bill Murray does in his day to day life, like he will just show up random places. Like there's all these stories of him going all around. Um, he just showed up at a frat party one time. He just did the dishes and he left. Right. He showed up um, at uh, there was a construction of uh, of a, a poetry center that was going on, and he just showed up at this construction site. Didn't announce it to anybody. Just showed up at the site and just read all the construction workers' poetry. Um, in a way, he just because he knows who he is, and he's very aware of you know the. I don't want to call it prestige, but, you know, the emphasis or the importance that society places on him as a celebrity. And he just goes out of his way to connect with regular people randomly um, through the most, um, 
I don't, uh, it's like, it's almost through the most regular means, right? To make those people feel special and make those people feel important. Like he just like, I was one story. He just photo bombed this, uh, this couple's wedding photos and he just showed up, didn't know who they were, but he took pictures with them. He spent the entire day. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I do love about that is he uses that as a way to, to give attention and focus to these strangers, to make them feel special, to, to give them this story, right? To share that moment with them in just the most sincere way. And like, it's, um, it's, it's almost as if he is, you know, he's kind of turned the, the stereotype of a, you know, celebrity on its head, right? He uses that prestige as a way to make others feel important. That's interesting. I really don't know much about him. I got to tell you. Um. Oh man. Uh, there's actually. Uh, I mean, if you just go to YouTube, just type in like philosophy of Bill Murray, you'll find a bunch of videos on it. You know where they talk about like um, the different things that he incorporates into like you know his antics or whatever. But like, um, it just seems like a very organic thing. You know what I mean? And I think that is one of the. I think that is one of the end products of, you know, mastering that self-awareness is that you realize even in even for a single moment what you can do to make others feel special, right? To give them something uh, that's lasting like an like an impression of you. I well I don't want to give you the impression that I think wrong with Bill Murray or what he does. I don't know. But I would say that in terms of like a, a wisdom master, that is not – in my experience, that's mm -hmm. not sort of the type of activity that they would be involved with because they don't think of themselves as, a, as anything. Okay. Like so they, they wouldn't be using their perceived fame to bring joy to somebody else because it's it's like it's focused through their own self-interest in that way. Like I can use my fame to benefit someone like but first you have to acknowledge that you're a, a self who's famous and that fame has some value to other people. Right, right. So the wisdom master and. I'm only going by my personal observation here. So it's, I, you know, as a witnessing for this, you know, I'm, I don't know how reliable I am, but my perception is the wisdom master thinks of themselves as like a bit of dust on your shoe and their whole trip is serving the divine. And so to them, nothing has any value like the the value of all things in in terms of like a reality quotient is equal, which is zero. Mm -hmm. So themselves has that value. You have that value and all appearance has that value. So. Like, they don't give a shit really in terms of the, like, are you made joyous by being with somebody famous and, like, that somehow, like, bring uplifts you? Like, their only real concern is, is the divine and wisdom mm -hmm. and, like, helping people grow into what they, per, you know, perceive right. as reality. So... Like to me that mostly the activities of those sorts of people involve um, teaching um, activities that benefit beings but don't bring attention to the teacher or the student in any way at all. It's 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 like uh it's like when you're around someone like that, you really perceive that like there's not actually anybody there. It's not like you're talking to a normal person. So I don't know if that really gives you any sense of it, but it's almost um, as if they've raised their perception of things or reality to the point that 
it's um, it's raised to the level of of existence of of uh, even before things have like a perceived meaning attached to them, right? Like almost like yeah. you're, you're raising your your consciousness to the level of like of like the formless, right? Even before like those platonic solids get their perfect it's even, forms. Yeah, even prior to consciousness yeah, where it's just yeah. p- pure awareness and openness and luminosity and that's all there is. And that doesn't negate a, the appearance of all phenomena, you know? It's just that the meaning of it is totally different and it's it's only has the ultimate meaning, which is the divine knowing itself. Mm-hmm. So in, for, when the divine knows itself, there's no need for fame. There's no need for um, any sort of uh, like dynamics in that way. I mean, they still happen, you know, in the minds of beings. But in reality, it, it, it's like it's, it's just all conceptual, all that stuff. And the, and the wisdom master is totally beyond conceptuality which it takes it into like a a realm of mystery that is beyond comprehension so i guess that we should uh, take a step back then uh to gertruf and uh, you know his um his levels of uh creating separation between you know the internal struggle the external struggle right and how you can uh, kind of take a step back and, you know, be witness to both of those, right, but still separate from them. I mean, I guess, uh, how do you change your thought processes in the moment to try and create those levels of separation? I don't think it's really possible for somebody to do kind of like on the fly or to like come up with a way to make that happen. I think it really requires like an authentic engagement with the methods of the path. And then you'd be fortunate if you were able to do it. But to try to do it without like the the full path and the methods and the teacher, Mm -hmm. I don't know that it can be done. I mean, sure, there's rare individuals like the Buddha or Christ or Krishna, but I mean, we could also say they were like divinely preordained to do those things. Right, so right. like for you and I, I think the most reliable method would be find a path and a teacher who's walked that path and accomplished it if, you, if that's possible and then you practice it and then you can judge, you know, whether those methods, whether those practices seem to be working or not. Like, I don't, I don't know of any other way to, to make it work. I wish there was honestly, cause it's hard and it's arduous. Well, that, and but, that, but mean, everything in life ta- that's worthwhile yeah. requires the hard work. So, you know, I mean, the other thing that like, how I guess that makes that so difficult is that, you know, kind of going back to our original topic with the new age movement is that there's so many people who take that role of spiritual master, right. And just turn it into something completely predatory. And it's yes. so hard to tell the difference between the hucksters out there and someone who is, you know, genuinely walked that path and had spiritual growth. Actually, it's less difficult to tell the difference than you might imagine. So, okay, here's some ways to know the authentic spiritual master doesn't want your money. The authentic spiritual master doesn't even want you as a student. The authentic spiritual master is not recruiting people for any organization or cause or anything. If it, it more than likely the authentic spiritual master is hiding away, avoiding students and fame and they're not publishing books and they're trying to avoid the spotlight as much as possible because they don't need that. Their joy is not based in any worldly thing. 
So they have no personal desire. The only reason that you would encounter someone like an authentic wisdom master who's a worthy teacher is because they have some sense of obligation that because they've reached this state that they feel they have to help other people. There's, and there's literally no other motivation at all. Like, so those are some ways you can tell. Um, there's probably others, but um, those are pretty easy ones because most spiritual teachers these days, and probably since time began, who are not authentic wisdom masters tend to do those sorts of self-aggrandizing spotlight seeking money grabbing behaviors now here's the rub even those teachers who are not wisdom masters and who are not really authentic and who are trying to to recruit students and make money, even those teachers benefit people, right? So it's not like they're useless or they're, you know, they're a scourge. It, it's, that's not the case, actually. The situation is that they actually do benefit their, some of their students and people do learn and grow as a result of interacting with them. So there's two sides to the coin, really, just like everything in life. Right, right. Well, then let me ask you, now that we're, uh, I don't know, I would say uh, getting like towards the end of the program, um, I guess, you know, if we're going to take this opportunity that this, you know, crisis uh, or this pandemic has created and uh, really try and, uh, you know, get in touch with our genuine selves, right? Um, what are some practices that people could be doing right now at home? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, if you've listened this far and found it interesting, I'm just going to go ahead and say like one good, really good practice if you don't do it already would be the first thing you get up in the morning before you even get out of bed is just sit up and visualize whatever, you know, deity or religious figure or saint or um, whatever person you think of, you know, if you can't think of like a deity or like a holy being, like maybe there's a person who you find so inspiring that you would call them a saint or, you know, and just to picture um, that being and hold that in your mind very first thing and have them like above your head and then, you know, and then to, you know, say a few words of spontaneous prayer from your heart, you know, to that person or divine being and then, you know, visualize them dissolving into light and then into your crown of your body and then, you know, carry that light with you through your day. And it really sets the tone and the intention for your day. Um, and, and there's really no reason you couldn't turn almost every activity that you do into a spiritual practice. I mean, my teacher talks about this all the time. He says, you know, you think you want to be spiritual practitioners, but there's so many moments throughout the day that you don't take advantage of. Like, for example, like one of the, he would give an example, like every time you walk through a doorway, you could say a, a prayer, like may the door of wisdom be open to all beings. Or whenever you turn on the light, you know, may the, the light of wisdom dawn in the minds of all beings you know, like little prayers like this, like yeah. throughout your day, like whatever you're doing, just to kind of remind yourself like who you are, what you're doing, what this is really all about, like really providing a much greater focus on 
the divine and less on like being self-concerned and like worried about circumstances like and this is a really good way to get out of the anxiety and the concern over the pandemic and all that's going on with the news is to really focus on the fact that um there are actually people suffering in this time uh, is with the pandemic and um and hopefully you know you're not one of them but if you're not one of them you can do spiritual practice for people that are suffering you can pray for them you can do meditation you can do offerings so there's and offerings are also another really good spiritual practice that gets overlooked like you know if you think about you know whatever deity or divine being that you are a close to or think of fondly or pray to you know you can make offerings of you know light or candles or flowers or water or alcohol or fresh fruit i mean there is like literally almost endless uh incense i mean there's so many various things that you could imagine that would be pleasing in a sensual way to the divine or to the deity. Um, and you can offer those things as a way of asking them for, um, the, to ease suffering or to, for protection. I mean, so I think so many things people could do. It's almost endless. And I think the difference is, you know, the intention that people put into it, because I think understanding what one's intention is, is is like one of those first steps um you know yes. to self-awareness because you know i mean how often have you well I, I know you have but how often does someone you know actually what a, take a step back from you know what their intended purpose is in that moment and look at the motivations behind it actually analyze why you want um a certain thing to go a certain way why you want it and really look at the motivations behind that and the way that they may connect to growth, right? Um, because self-awareness is something that, you know, I mean, at least from a cultural level, you know, we actively suppress in Western culture. And it didn't used to be that way. You know, the West used to have a very rich um, spiritual tradition, but over the years, you know, the that spiritual tradition, um, you know, through centuries of uh, it being used for political gain. Um, now it's obviously being used for financial gain, right? Um, you know, the intention of that spiritual, uh, that spirituality or the intention of that faith has been polluted, right? And I think that, um, you know, rediscovering that spiritual intention at an individual level is important because, if we all actively engage in kind of repairing that, then um, we're all, you know, sharing that intention together. Yeah. And and uh, I think we do, whether we'd like know it or not, um, we do share that uh, ultimate intention, which is for the divine to know itself because the divine is unknowable. It has no sense organs, right? It has us. We're the sense organs of the divine. If we don't know the divine, it can't know itself. So it's, it's not just like a, a nice thing or, you know what I mean? It's literally like an obligation in a way. So that's the ultimate purpose of a human being and that provides ultimate meaning beyond any thing in particular so yeah i almost look yeah. at it as like i don't know at least this is just my own kind of thoughts on the matter um you know i i'm one of those guys that i try and and uh, find an allegory for everything. And um, one of the biggest allegories that I 
uh, to have created for myself is, you know, the creation, right? The Big Bang, as it were. I mean, before the Big Bang, there was nothing. But how could nothing have a definition if there's never been anything before? So, you know, if you think about nothing before creation, it's almost like its nothingness made it absolute, right? It made it, uh, it made it one thing. It completed itself. And I don't know, I feel like when God realized its own consciousness, right, it could no longer be conscious or it would be finite. So it had to shatter itself amongst creation. So, you know, kind of like the Big Bang, right? It shattered itself on the material realm as well as the, you know, astral higher realms, spiritual realms, whatever you want to, you know, uh, call it. But I guess that's the ultimate purpose is to put that consciousness back together, to place those shards back into the absolute. I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of theological language around that. And um, for me personally, it's really helpful to take that out of the equation And um, I'm not saying people should or shouldn't, but you may want to consider that if we think of the pursuit of wisdom as resolving the mind rather than somehow being able to trace back like a factual historical creation. I, and I don't want to use the word mythology because it's almost like a, you know, because it, it, it's, there's like scientific research into this. So, so to me, like that's not the domain of, of wisdom traditions. I'm not saying they don't speak about it. They do, but, for me, it's again, like it's really helpful to get out of the like the theological and the historical and the scientific and really focus on like if everything is mind and look at it from that perspective, then I don't really have to worry about like historical beginnings or origins. All I know is what is right in front of me. And I don't really, again, going back to like how I know things or just of how I've been told by other people. So like I can't know anything about some like divine being that I have no perception of directly. Um, in, in terms of like the way uh, like a creator being is thought of. I don't mean like divinity itself, but I mean like the concept of a creator being. Right. And then I don't have any way of knowing anything about a Big Bang or the formation of what I perceive to be physical substance, material reality. Um, and the view that I hold like essentially denies its validity altogether so for me personally, looking at it strictly in relation to what is mind, what is appearance, what is awareness, um, how does one go from being a mechanical being as we were talking about to being a human being to being conscious to then going beyond consciousness to aware, pure awareness and and then and that would be the realization that awareness and all of appearance are not two things it's one thing so that's the journey but i think that journey is made incredibly less cumbersome when we i don't want to say do away with but like we really when we just stop like considering the things that we can't really ever know anything about ever, even if we try, which is 
the a concept lot. of a creator god. Yeah. The the Big Bang and the origin of of the universe and everything. Um, I would love to think like, yeah, one day we'll know. But I honestly, in my heart, don't ever think humans will ever know those things. And I don't even know if those things are actually real. And I know that in like a scientific material culture, it's like heresy to even say that. But it's the way I feel about it at this point. So I guess uh, I guess it goes back to, you know, having the self-awareness um, to know that you don't know. Yeah, that that's a good place to begin, I think. For me, that was really the place where I could finally be honest with myself about myself. Because coming from a place of ignorance, like it, it was an honest ignorance. And I could at least build from that and like try to start learning from the place where I could admit that I didn't know anything and I thought that I had known a lot of things and I just had to get rid of them all and kind of start over and look at what I could know, what I couldn't know, what is true about me. And even then it's a constant process of going back and checking and then going to the teacher and saying, well, like, I think this, but, and then him saying, no, that's not it. You need to look at this instead. And so it's, it's a, it's a process like human beings are not static. There's never an end point. We're never finished or complete. We're always a work in progress. But if we actively engage that work with intention, as you talked about, we have the capability to become really, really good people. And maybe if we're really lucky, one or two of us will actually become wisdom masters, you know. But for most of us, like becoming a good person, that's that's a lot. I mean, that's huge. I think. I mean, I think that's really huge because good people are uh, they're the inspiration in the world. They are capable of helping others when the situation arises. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the people that you always want to be around. So. Yeah, they're the people who can, they're the people who will go up to a stranger and, you know, make them feel, make them feel heard, make them feel validated, you know. They're the yeah, ones that that's will, right. They're the ones that will go out of their way to, you know, um, mm -hmm. help those in need. And, you know, even even when it has no uh, no level of self-interest to themselves, right? Like they just want to share that moment and then they know through self-awareness they have the ability to make this moment better for someone and um, to make that moment meaningful, right? Um, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, the, the usual like working in a soup kitchen, whatever the case may be, but, um, you know, but they have, but they have a way to make people feel validated, to make people feel special without, you know, stroking one's ego, to make someone feel um, appreciated, I guess. Yeah, but even more than appreciated, they're, you know, they're capable of actually providing, you know, real aid and benefit and like in terms of like whatever the situation may be which is important because uh i mean look at what's going on right now you just never know what's going to happen and in for somebody to be capable and able to help others and be beyond the need of help themselves in a situation like this it's very big it's a huge thing and um we should all aspire to be that type of person yeah well i don't know particularly like you know pandemics such as this like and i, I this will probably be our ending point too is that 
it brings out, you know, the fear, the anxiety, the despair in some people, but it also brings out the best in others. Um, I mean, if there was a time that you as an individual were going to step up and be a hero, to be there for those who are sick, to be there for those who can't help themselves, now's the time to do it. Now's the time for you to, you know, take the steps of self-awareness to to analyze your intention and to be the person that you know that you want to be. And you might not know what that person is. You might not know what that, you know, version of you looks like, right? But the first step is a desire to aspire to it. Yeah, for sure. And I agree. And I think one way it might appear is that a person, instead of sp- you know, even though they may have fear and be anxious themselves, they don't go spreading it all over the place with other people. Instead, they share tender heartedness and love and compassion with other people, you know, even though they may be fearful. And, you know, because I think that goes a long way if you can just be a beacon of light in a time when other people are losing their minds for the most part that 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 in and of itself is helpful yeah and uh well i mean i don't know if you're going to um i mean if you're going to aspire to be that person i mean now's the time to do it um, but I think, you know, the first steps of, you know, wanting that, or I guess not the first steps of wanting that, but the first steps of seeking that out is going to, you know, be seeking that divinity within yourself, right? Because if you are aspiring to be someone who's completely selfless, right? Someone who is, um, someone who's always looking at the, the benefit of others before yourself you need to have that part of yourself that is above those external and internal um inputs right you have to be above all those things you have to be separate and you have to have this higher i don't want to say a higher calling because that just makes it seem like it's too preordained but this higher intention beyond what could benefit you or your situation. And I feel like a lot of people want that. A lot of people seek that out. And, uh, you know, they may look for it in the wrong ways. They might engage in the wrong activities to find it. Um, But finding it is a very personal journey. And finding it is... um, it's, It's something that, you know, it's difficult it's painful because you have to make some realizations about yourself that you might have wanted to put off. But also it's, you know, admitting to yourself that even if you may not have the answer, you can still inspire others to find it for themselves. Yeah, that's a good point, I think. So before we take off, um, I don't know, let me ask you if there was um, any piece of advice that you would give someone who's, um, um, you know, isolated right now or, you know, maybe feeling afraid or maybe feeling uh, anxious or, you know, maybe just really depressed and feeling that they don't have control over anything that's going on. What would you tell them? Um, I would say that you don't have much control but we never really have much control and if you think about it like what do we actually control right what we control is what we think about for the most part that's and and even that we do with like really bad control like we don't actually exercise control because like you can't control the motion of the stars and the planet uh, you can't control your blood flow or your digestion or your, you know, the way you excrete waste. Uh, you can't even control your dreams. Uh, you you lay down, but you can't really control when you fall asleep exactly. Right. It just kind of happens. Like, so what exactly 
do we have control over? We certainly have, don't have control over the damn virus. Um, again, all we can hope to do is learn how to control our mind. So, and, and this goes directly to the anxiety, the worry, the fear. These are all manifestations of a mind that is essentially out of control, right? So, if we accept that as our axiom, then the, the only logical response is to begin engaging in activities that, to discipline the mind, right? Meditation, contemplation, uh, yoga, like physical yoga mm -hmm. would be good, um, you know, any activity that will discipline your mind and force your thoughts in directions that are beneficial, like towards your health, towards s silence and stillness and solitude, uh, towards the divine, um, like orienting yourself in that direction, that's the way to go. And that will ultimately overcome all of the worry and the fear and the anxiety and the loneliness and and all of those things completely obliterate and outshine them utterly but it requires like you actually have to like get down on the floor and do it and nobody can do it for you and there is some like sweat there might be some tears involved. I'm not kidding. It's like there, it brings some stuff out. But really bringing that stuff out and going through it is the way, like Carl Jung, like you were talking about earlier, like going through the darkness is the only way to get to the light. You know, you got to go through the shadow. Alchemy says the same thing. Yoga, it's all, these are all, it's a process. We talked about this. It's a process. And only by engaging the process can we overcome our own self-concern, which is really the, at the root of this. Because we don't really have anything to be concerned about. Like we're completely held and loved by the divine. And, you know, we don't really perceive that, you know, most, if not all the time, but it's true. And um, if we even could know for just a few moments the depth and breadth of that love, then we would have no doubt that, um, you know, there's nothing to fear, even in the midst of the chaos and the craziness and the pandemic, you know, that there's really ultimately nothing to fear that it will it doesn't reduce the the ultimate meaning one bit you know but until we discipline our mind fully you know we are gonna suffer to some extent right right well i guess to finish up folks um if you would anybody who is listening um you know engage with me for a moment because uh, we're going to put some of this pra or what, some of this uh, theory into practice here. Um, so, folks, what we're going to do is a meditation that was actually uh, concocted by Marcus Aurelius, um, Emperor of Rome, and this is how he would end every day. So, wherever you are, take a step back, close your eyes, and just do a little bit of deep breathing. Just find something that's comfortable for you, something that uh, you don't have to really focus on, but it just kind of comes secondhand, right? And I want you to think about everything in your personal life right now, good or bad, your fears, your anxieties, um, your, your concerns, right? But you could also be experiencing a lot of great things, right? You could also have... Um, Concern for friends that makes you feel special, concern for, you know, people that you love. Just think about all the things going on in your life that could potentially be happening and the different ways that you could perceive them. Now, kind of take a step back from yourself 
and just in your community, think about all the things outside yourself that could be happening right now. Think about um, kids off of school riding their bikes, playing together. Think about um, a quarantined family, you know, playing a board game. Think about someone experiencing their first kiss, right? Think about all the things that could be occurring. Now, take a step back even further. Think about everything going on in the country right now. Think about a mother concerned about how she's going to pay her rent because she's been laid off. Think about someone in New York on a respirator thinking that they're going to die, questioning their own mortality. Now take a step back even further and imagine the entire world in front of you. Think about a mother holding her dead child in Afghanistan right now. Think about bot flies infesting someone in Africa. Think about all the things outside of the pandemic. Think of all these things that are occurring right now, both good and bad, and know that they're all the same. They're all part of that greater story. They're all part of that greater purpose. All suffering, all love, everything serves a purpose, and so do you. But you need to practice self-awareness to know the true and genuine intention of the purpose that you serve in with your life. Times are difficult. Times are hard. And no one wants to live to see such times. But, you know, that's not for us to decide, folks. The only thing that we can do is decide what we can do with the time that is given to us. Have a good evening, folks. That's the show. Thanks again, Greg, for coming on. It was a fantastic discussion. I'm glad I was able to share this moment with you and able to converse with you about these things that, you know, sometimes we really should be putting a little bit more intention and self-awareness on. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. It's really been a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, I hope that people listening um, find some benefit from this conversation. And, uh, you know, if uh, you did find some benefit on this conversation, you are interested in Greg's uh, very uh, particular perspective on life, then why don't you go ahead and give him a follow at the Occult of Personality podcast. Um, I've been listening to the Occult of Personality for quite some time. He always has some of the... I mean, it's just some of the most enlightened people on the show to talk more in depth about all these different... Um, esoteric eastern and western topics so you know if you're interested in spirituality you're interested in religious practices definitely uh, give him a like follow and uh that's a uh, occult of personality.com correct red yeah dot com and dot net so yeah check it out i appreciate it and uh there's lots of uh podcasts there to check out and uh interviews Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they're all top notch. Um, if people wanted to go ahead and get in touch with you, do you have a, a specific uh, social media handle you prefer folks to reach out at? Um, they can reach me uh, at the Occult of Personality Facebook page. Uh, they can reach me on Twitter, Occult of Personality. Uh, yeah, that or that's probably the easiest or shoot me an email. If Thank you.